apply it to the world around us. And so the last section of this passage tells us that we are to walk humbly with our God. Now this one's a little bit harder to to get our head around because it can mean various things. But I want to tell you a little story. On Tuesday night, um, I took Abby down to UQ at St. Lucia. So she's come to the end of her uh, program with them where they provide mentors and uh, help uh, for students coming through high school and and into university. And it's part of a a wider scholarship that they do uh, called the, the YAP program, so Young Achievers Program. And so we were sitting in an auditorium down there, all nice and socially distanced, uh, listening to all the names of the grade 10 students from, um, from high schools all around Brisbane that have been awarded this scholarship uh, for the next five years. Then once they did those names, they then did the year 12s uh, that were graduating from the program. So obviously Abby was one of those ones. After that, they had some people that had been through the program uh, years ago and they were there to talk to basically to everyone about what this program is about and how it helped them to get to where they are. And so there was four people there. One of them uh, was one of the ones graduating, so we sort of knew his story. But the other three, uh, one of them had never actually been through the p- program himself, but he was, is currently a mentor, a senior mentor. And so he outlined some of the things that he gets to do working with these young people. The other two... One came from Tagulawa, um, went through Tagulawa State High School. The other one, I think, went through Stanthorpe. So country kids uh, coming from schools where there was only about 100 people. But one of them them uh, went through a uni, got her degree in, uh, what's, giving out medicine, pharmacy. (laughs) You, You see them in the back there doing stuff with their hands, but you never see the medicine. So she got her degree in pharmacy. And now she's going on to become a doctor. The other one had gone through and did a dual degree in, I think it was physio and something else, or HPE and science, something like that. And that, but she's now going back to uni and becoming a high school teacher. For both of them, it was all about being able to give back, not just to the, um, the students coming through, but being able to give back to the communities in which had supported them over the years. So these two young women, very smart people, incredibly intelligent to get to where they are. And they've had all sorts of hardships to get to where they are. But all of them, all four of them, in their stories, recognised the need for their family support systems and for the wider support systems that they had. That they recognised that they could not have gotten to where they were, not just physically, but um, with their degrees and everything else. They couldn't get to that point without having people to support them. They could not do it alone. What impressed me most was that there was no swollen heads amongst them. There was nobody sitting there saying, hey, look at how good I am. I have done this and this and this, and I deserve all the stuff that comes because I've worked hard. There was none of that. They did not play down what they'd done, though. It wasn't like they sat there and said, oh... It was all about everybody else. It, they all did, did all this stuff and I just benefited. They recognised and spoke about how they had to work hard. But it was not about them. They didn't want it to be about them. It was just a simple humility that they had that inspired and was inspiring the next generation of uni students and future leaders. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines humility as freedom from pride or arrogance. Anybody here humble? Is that because no one's putting their hand up because you're all humble? (laughs) I'll get to that in a moment. (laughs) To think of yourself as a nobody means that you have no influence. Sorry, go back. Humility isn't thinking that you are a nobody. To think of yourself as a nobody means that you have no influence, that you are completely unimportant or insignificant. If you think of yourself like that, then you've bought into Satan's lie. And I should know. I thought thought that way about myself for years. People would tell me that I was a humble person, 
I remember a particular occasion where my auntie uh, pulled me aside and used those words. I've had some of you uh, guys say that to me in the past. Some of you on the way out the door in, in the past would come up and say, uh, what a great sermon you preached at times. Not every week. I know, I know I've had bad weeks. <laughs> Not too often. <laughs> See, that's the humility. <laughs> but people would say that. And my standard response was, oh, it wasn't me, it was God speaking. I'd never take any credit for it. And people would assume that was humility. You know what it really was? Sorry? Proud? No, it was opposite of being proud. Shy? I'm definitely shy. But I didn't think anything of myself. I thought I was, wasn't worth um, complimenting. It was easier to, to give God the glory, which is what we should always do, shouldn't we? But it wasn't about... I thought it was about giving God glory, but it wasn't. It was about taking the spotlight off me because I'm worthless. Who am I that, that people should say nice things about me? The reality was that I had no self-esteem. Which is strange because we often think of people with no self-esteem are the ones that have been through all sorts of hardships in life. and, um, and that, You understand the kind of person I'm talking about that everything's just gone badly for them over the years and so, or had people telling them that they're worthless, that they're nobodies, that you'll never amount to anything and that they're bought into to that. I've never had any of that and yet I still believed this lie of Satan that I was no one, I was worthless, I wasn't worth listening to. Let me be clear about this this morning. Humility and insecurity are not the same thing. So if you try to label yourself, uh, label your insecurity as humility, humility, you're actually hurting yourself and you do a disservice to your maker. I know this morning that there are many of you sitting here that would put yourself in that same category. There are many of you sitting here this morning that you think maybe well, from the outside, it looks like you're a humble person. But the reality is, you don't believe you're good enough. You don't believe you're worth anything. That compared to other people, you're a nobody. What have I got to offer? Why would people listen to me? I can't do anything. I know for some of you, you've had people in your life telling you that stuff for years. And you've believed it. And particularly as children... It's hard not to believe it, isn't it? When you've got a parent telling you that you are going to amount to nothing in life, that they wish you weren't around, that you're just a drag on them, that you just make their life more difficult than it needs to be, you start to, to believe those things and you think you're worthless. You think you're nobody. And if I feel like that, why would God do anything with me? Why would God want to know me? Listen to what the Bible has to say. What God says about you. Genesis chapter 1. So at the very beginning of life in this world, the Bible says, so God created man, and we know when it says man, he's talking about humanity. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So the first thing that God wants us to know is that you are made in his image. Not you are God. And if you believe that you're just as good as God, then you've got the opposite problem. What John said, that's prideful. We don't want to go there either. But if you're made in God's image, then you've been made good. Yes, sin has corrupted, but God made you the way he sees himself. Psalm 139, 13 to 16. For you, form, for you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. 
My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. So God knew you before you were even made. Before your parents even considered having you, God knew you. And he had your days listed out before him. Does that sound like a God that does not care about you? Does that sound like a God that thinks that you are worthless? That you were made to be worthless? That you're made to be garbage? To be not considered by others? It doesn't sound like the God that I love. We went and saw uh, Casey and the baby just the other day. And looking at this little newborn baby and seeing how much this baby was loved, it makes you think, wow, that's how God sees me. When we're hopeless, when we're um, powerless, when we can't protect ourselves, when we can't even look after ourselves, God is there. Watching Casey put her hand just on his little stomach. That's what God does for us, doesn't he? That reassurance that when we're, life is tough, you are not alone. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. We should know this one well. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God himself gave up his life for those that thought they were worth nothing. For those that were broken by sin, that believed the lies, that lived out the lies. Christ died for you. The Bible says, who's going to die for even a good person? Someone might, but for an unrighteous person, not likely that anyone's going to die. But Jesus did. And he did it for you. Even in your brokenness, in your stubbornness, in your pain. You are not a nobody. Sorry? Jesus died for you, which makes you not a nobody. What does it make you? A somebody. You are a somebody. You have a body. Therefore, you are somebody. And if you have a body, your body was made in Christ's image, in God's image. And so he loves you. He died for you. You are not nobody. And I know for some of you, you're probably wrestling right now with that. You hear it. You know that's what the Bible says. You know God has done these things for you. You know that he loves you. But in your mind, there's this battle going on saying, no, nah, I can't accept it. I can't, can't actually hold on to that. I might for a moment, but as soon as I get back out there, no, nah, it's all going to disappear again. And I'm going to go back to people that make me feel worthless. And I'm going to go back into situations where I feel worthless and hopeless and lonely. Where I feel like a nobody. But you are not a nobody. God made you to be a somebody. His somebody. In fact, you're actually part of his body. Do we realize that? We, it's maybe not the physical part, but we are called to be a part of Christ's body. What do we know that as? We should all know the answer to that because we're sitting in a building that has that label, but we know that the building is not Christ's body. But we are called to be a part of the church, his body. You are somebody to carry out his kingdom's work in this world. And to receive and to revel in the love that he has for you. I thought it was amazing when that word came to me, that we're to revel in his love. How many of us revel in God's love? Is that a word that we still use? Some still use it? Many of us know that we receive God's love, but do we rejoice in it? There's the third R, I can turn that into a sermon. Do we rejoice in what God has done for us each and every day? 
even in those moments when life is tough? Do you wake up in the morning and when your bones are creaking and it's hard to move and you haven't put your hearing aids in yet so you can't hear anything and or your dog's jumping all over you like ours did this morning and causing all sorts of pain? Do we wake up and say, wow, thank you for a new day, Lord. Thank you for your love. Or does it take a bit of time for you to warm up to that? We are to revel in his love. We are to to worship him. We are to praise him. Not just with songs like we've done this morning. Although great songs, aren't they? A lot of meaning in them. But in the actions and the words that we use all through the day. For some of us, myself included, we've got a long way to go before we get to that point where everything in our life is an act of worship. There's plenty that I do that I think, or it's pointed out to me later that that was no way for a Christian to act. But the desire, my heart, is to be able to live a life that's fully engaged with God, fully worthy of Him. And if your heart is like that, then there's no room in your heart to say that you're a nobody because God doesn't accept worship from nobodies. The Bible says that people will call on his name, but if, if they don't believe in him, if they don't accept him as Lord, if they don't believe what he says about them, then it's worthless. It's a clanging gong. How many of you know people that have voices like that? When they start talking, you just tune out because it's like, oh, it's just a drone. If you don't know anybody like that, you may be the person. So just check that. But God wants worship from somebody's. And you are a somebody. Often when it comes to this verse, preachers will point out that to walk humbly with our God, to walk humbly with Jesus, means that we are to rid ourselves of pride and arrogance. That it's actually the opposite of to what I've been talking about. That you can't be one of those people that um, stands on the street corners and say, hey, look at me, I'm so great. I'm not talking about the street preachers. I'm talking about people that promote themselves actively. And for some areas of business and some areas of life, you're told that that's what you need in order to succeed. That if you want to get ahead in your workplace or in sport and, or in other areas, you've got to promote yourself. That's what... Um, if Grace was still here, she'd say, that's what resumes are about. Trying to get people's attention to say, wow, this person's somebody. But I know for most of you, that's not the problem, is it? Very few of you would stand up and say, hey, look at me. If I asked you to come forward and to speak in the microphone, how many of you would jump at the chance to, to get up in front of everybody and say, hey, listen to me? It'd be the opposite, wouldn't it? It's like, head down, please don't let him look at me, please don't let him look at me. (laughs) He might pick my name. That's why Sylvia's doing that right now. (laughs) Because I sometimes pick on her. (laughs) See what happens? You do the opposite, you still get picked on. (laughs) Most of us have the opposite problem, that we don't want to be recognised, we don't want to be seen, we don't want to be pointed out. Because we think we're not good enough. That we're not even good enough to have pride in ourselves. Let alone arrogance. But let me tell you this. What John said before was actually the right answer. Even though I said no to him. So I told a bit of a lie there. Thinking so lowly of yourself that you are worth nothing or good for nothing is a form of pride. It is a form of arrogance. Because those thoughts and feelings leave no reason, oh sorry, no room for Jesus to work in and through you. If you hold on to those lies so tightly that nothing's ever going to change it, how on earth is God going to be able to break through? How are you going to accept what he has to say if you hold on to those thoughts and feelings so tightly? So many of us live with past thoughts and actions. What others have said to us in the past, we hold on to those things so tightly that we have no room to allow our future and our very present to be changed. 
And Satan loves that because he knows if, we keep, if he keeps us bound up in the lies, how can we walk with God? We're too busy listening to Satan than to listen to God. You have to stop believing the lies. Let go of those lies. Let go of the people that keep reminding you of the lies. Tell them you're not going to listen to it anymore. You're not going to accept it anymore. You know the best way to counter the lies? should listen to the opposite, shouldn't we? If you don't want to believe a lie anymore, listen to the truth. Where do we hear the truth? Sorry? The Bible? Yep. It's a great place to start because you can carry it anywhere with you. And if you don't want to carry the big heavy book around, and I was at Kurong the other day looking at new Bibles because mine's falling apart. And I picked up some of them and I thought, no way. If I've got to lug this back and forth to church, I'm not going to bring it. But there are lighter ones. There's ones with big print in them so you can read it. Now, if you have problems with eyesight, I picked up some of them. It's like, is that one line or is that the whole page? They're so small. If you don't like carrying physical things like that around, we pretty much all of us have mobile phones these days, don't we? Where you can have a hundred different versions of the Bible right on you. But it's no good carrying it around if you never turn it on or open it up and listen to the words that are in it. And for some of us, we need to do that daily. Maybe even more than daily. We have to open it up many times until the lies start to fade and the truth starts to to break its way through. As I said last week, that's what's called discipleship. What we're called to do. We're called to to get to know God, listen to what he has to say to us. But not just listen to it, believe it, accept it. And quite often, it's in the reverse order. We've got to hear it, we've got to accept it, and then believe it. But we've got to stop believing the lies. If you have accepted Jesus, if you believe in the work that he accomplished on the cross... He says this about you in John chapter 1, verse 12. But to all who did receive him, to all who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. You have the right to call yourself a child of God if you believe him. It's hard to call yourself a child of God and also say you're worthless in the same sentence, isn't it? Because it means that either Christ died in vain or you're lying about yourself. And which one of those two is more likely to be the truth? You can actually answer that. (laughs) Which one's going to be the the truth? You're not sure? (laughs) Put it this way. God does not lie. (laughs) God has never lied. It's not in him to lie. To lie is to go against the very core of who he is. He cannot. God is truth. So that means we're the liars, isn't it? That we're lying to ourselves, that we're believing the lies. If you're a child of God, you've got to stop lying to yourself. You've got to start believing the truth. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 6, it says, Therefore... As you received Christ Jesus the Lord, which I believe you have done, if you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. It's not just a one-time acceptance. We have to walk with Him and walk in Him. And there is a difference. To walk with Him is all those discipleship things that we're told to do and we talk about doing. Picking up your Bible and reading it, praying, Walking in him means that we have to actually accept those things that he says about himself. The things that we read in the Bible, the things that we we pray to him. When we pray, that we actually pray with belief that God can change things, that God can move mountains. Do we believe our prayers get answered? 
I had an answer to prayer just this week. I won't go into it. But it was within minutes of being asked to pray for something. God answered that prayer. And you know what happened? I won't go into the story. I started to believe into the lie that it was because I prayed God did this. And I caught myself out the other day thinking, hang on. God wanted me to pray, but it was God that brought the miracle. It was God that answered the prayer. It wasn't me. I was, all I was was obedient. That's what humility is, recognising that, yes, we've done the right thing, but it's God that does the work. And so we walk in him. We trust in him. We accept him for who he is and what he can do. When we walk with confidence in what he has done in us and continues to do in us, we can walk humbly with him, achieving all he has prepared for us in advance to do. We can walk humbly with him, knowing he hears our prayers, that his spirit is within us, and that he will enable us to achieve those plans that he has already put into place. That key word there is confidence. Paul often used that word, being confident in this, trusting in this, believing the things I have taught you from the beginning. We've got to have confidence. And for many of us, that's what we lack, isn't it? Somebody has destroyed that confidence. Situations have destroyed that confidence. Medical issues can destroy that confidence. But what do we put our confidence in? Do we put our confidence in all those things? Or do we put it in the one who is bigger than this universe? See, we put our confidence in all sorts of stuff, don't we? Money, cars, actually not so much cars because they will break down. Houses, well, houses get floods through them and fall apart. Politicians, well, they cause problems. Our doctors, well, they get it wrong sometimes too. There is so much stuff that we put our confidence in, but all of it is broken. None of it is worth that same level of confidence. We're going to have trust in some of those things at some point, don't we? But none of it should have the same level of confidence as what we can put in the one who's created everything, who holds the universe not just us, though we're there too. Not just Ipswich or Queensland, which is a pretty big place really, isn't it? If you want to go driving up to Cape York, you're not going to make it in 24 hours, are you? I don't know. Has any of you, any of you done that? The world, the solar system, we can't get our heads around how big God is, can we? And yet we shrink him down so much to the point where we have no confidence in him. And if we can't trust him, how do we walk with him? But it's exactly what God wants of us. He wants us to walk with him. Remember this. Your life is no longer your own. If you believe these lies about yourself then you're believing something that uh, is wrong about God. Your life is not your own anymore. Your life is His. And so you live it for Him. And you live it with Him. By grounding yourself in His Word, and through prayer, through coming and gathering together with His believers, you will see your true worth to Him. The more you listen to to the old hymns and modern songs, the more you listen to what the Bible has to say and listen to preachers that preach the, the Word of God accurately, the more you do your Bible studies, the more you talk to one another and, and listen to those true words that are being spoken to you, the more you will see your true worth to Him. It's like a child, isn't it? If you spend your... Uh, all your words praising the child, building them up, encouraging them, 
telling them what a good person they are, there's a good chance they're going to believe it, isn't it? That they're going to see themselves the way you see them. That's what God does for us. He's told us the truth about ourself, how he sees us. And it's a humbling experience when you see yourself through his eyes. But it's also empowering as well as you stop acknowledging the lies and accept the truth. As you act justly, love mercy and walk humbly with your God, you will be set free. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you love us so much that you didn't leave us in our sinful state. That, Father, that your word shows us who we were, but it also tells us who we're becoming. Lord, we know that there's an enemy that fights against us, that seeks to keep us chained down, to held in our lies, held in our prisons. But Lord, you've broken every prison. You've shattered every chain. Lord, you have opened the way for us to see ourselves the way you see us. And we pray, Father, that as we start to accept those things about ourselves for the first time, Lord, we, we ask that it helps us to walk all the more humbly with you, that it enables us to accomplish what you've tasked us to do, that we won't gain swollen heads, but, Father, we'll have swollen hearts for you and for this world. Lord, help us to love you the way that you're worth, worthy of. And Lord, help us to love ourselves the way you loved us, that sacrificial love that we see on the cross. Lord, may our lives praise you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.